Uh, my name is Leonid, and I will talk about some work that we did together with Peter on device drivers for Linux at UNSW and NICTA. Um, so before I, in this talk, I will mainly talk about nasty things like bugs and crashes. So before I go into that unpleasant stuff, let me say something positive. Um, so let me say that nowadays the Linux kernel is a reasonably reliable piece of software. It can run for many weeks without crashing under heavy workloads. And if it does crash, it's usually because of a bug in a device driver. Uh, which is not surprising given that most of the kernel code is actually in device drivers and driver code contains several times more bugs per line of code than the rest of the kernel. Um, there are a few reasons for this. One of them is that a lot of the time driver developers are not necessarily kernel experts, although sometimes they are. Um, drivers don't get tested as much as the rest of the kernel for obvious reasons. And another reason is that a lot of the time, proper hardware documentation is simply not available. So driver developers have to you know, reverse engineer Windows drivers, use some pieces of reference code. Um, there are some data sheets, but usually they are incomplete and inconsistent in many ways. All of which makes writing a correct driver kind of hard. Um, so anyway, clearly if you want to keep improving the reliability of the Linux kernel, we need to focus on drivers. So what I'll try to do in this talk is mainly to better understand driver failures, uh, specifically to identify the factors that, um, that introduce complexity into the drivers and that cause bugs. And I'll try to do it quantitatively so that we know how much improvement we can expect by uh, investing into each of these factors. Um, also, in the end, I will make some suggestions about changes that could be made to the Linux kernel to make it a more driver-friendly environment. So uh, in order to learn about driver bugs, we used a selection of real bugs found um, in a number of drivers in Linux during a number of years. Um, we took, specifically, we took 13 drivers for our study, and we tried to make this selection as diverse as possible. So we have drivers in different buses, USB, firmware, and PCI. We have different families of drivers, like uh, we have Ethernet, USB hub, storage, audio, uh, InfiniBand, even frame buffer. Uh, and we looked at both really simple drivers and really complex ones, and everything in the middle. Um, so altogether, we looked at almost 500 different bugs. And we categorized them into four categories uh, based on um, basically, sorry? It's it's a huge driver. It's ten thousand lines of code, and yeah, mm -hmm. so it's proportional to its size. Okay. Mm. <laughs> um, and, and another interesting thing about the driver. So usually when I you know say we are studying driver bugs, trying to understand why drivers crash, why they suck so much, people say hey, it's obvious. It's because driver developers are you know drooling idiots. They're just monkeys, and which is not true because many of the drivers are actually developed by people who maintain the same, the appropriate subsystem in the kernel. So for example, this InfiniBand driver is maintained by uh, the person who is actually maintaining the InfiniBand, the InfiniBand framework. Uh, so these people know what they're doing, but still there's something that forces them to make all these errors. Um, Okay, why? Okay. Um, okay, so anyway, we categorize these bugs into four groups based on um, the aspect of the driver functionality which causes where this bug is introduced. And the first group is what we call device protocol violations. So basically, these are all the errors in the interface between the driver and the device. Uh, all the things like putting the device in the wrong state, uh, incorrectly interpreting device state, um, sending incorrect data to the device or incorrectly passing data received from the device. So just a few examples. So the first one is classical situation when there is a shared ring buffer uh, between the driver and the device and uh, the driver basically incorrectly, b because the driver and the device are using the buffer concurrently, there is a lot of potential for risk conditions. For example, this uh, BNX to Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet driver uh, managed to acknowledge 
packets received from the network before actually processing these packets. Uh, so if the buffer was full, then the, the device could potentially override um, some of these buffers while they are being written, uh, read by the driver, which caused nasty oops in the kernel. Uh, also, often the driver um, incorrectly understands the state machine of the device, which is the case, which was the case for the USB hub driver. So this driver takes uh, every new device connected to the USB hub through a series of states. And at some point, it uh, reads the speed property so that it can report to the operating system whether it's a low speed or high speed or a full speed device. Uh, and it used to do it after the device was connected, but before it was enabled. At which point, according to the USB spec, um, the, the, well, the, the corresponding signal is not yet stabilized. So this was basically a bogus value that it returned to the S. Um, a lot of the time, driver manages to send incorrectly formatted data to the device, which was the, which is one of the bugs in the Infinihost driver. So it supports several um, types of requests, one of which allows the driver to put some immediate data in the request. There is a special field for it. But for whatever reason, the driver managed to use, to, to put the immediate data in the flex field instead, which of course confused the device. Uh, Many of these bugs are actually not the driver developer's fault at all, but they are a bug in the hardware, uh, which the driver is trying to mitigate somehow. So the same BNX2 uh, driver, uh, or rather some of the uh, models of the BNX2 device, uh, managed to stop sending uh, link status notifications. So when you plug or unplug your network cable, it would stop sending an interrupt uh, to software. And so the workaround was basically to pull for link status changes instead for those chips. So overall, all of these uh, device protocol relations are accountable for 38% of all bugs, at least in our study. Uh, second groups are software protocol relations. So obviously any driver talks to the Linux kernel uh, using and providing some services. And so if the driver fails to follow the protocol defined by the kernel for it, um, it can cause nasty, nasty things to happen. Um, a lot of these bugs are during initialization and configuration of the driver. For example, the USB disk driver uh, was calling the uh, SCSI at host function, which registers the, device, the driver as a new SCSI host before calling SCSI set device to SSH a device structure with, 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 with the host. So essentially in the first call, the uh, host structure wasn't initialized, which again could uh, create an oops in the kernel. Um, a large group of bugs are when the driver fails to follow the discipline for exchanging buffers uh, with the operating system. So uh, again, in the Infinihost driver, uh, an infinite driver has to provide an abstraction of a keeper to the operating system, which is basically a data channel or something similar to a socket. Think of it as a socket. And one of the things that the OS may do to the, to the keeper is put it from an active state into a reset state, in which case it must be completely quiescent. It shouldn't send or receive any more data. However, because the driver was forgetting to clean uh, the completion queue, it could happen that even in the reset state, it could still uh, send some um, completion notifications to the S, to the Linux kernel when it wasn't prepared to handle them anymore. Um, these days, a lot of drivers have to implement power management, well, ideally all of them, if you want to shut your laptop and then open it again and keep working with it. Um, and it co seems to cause a lot of confusion for driver developers. Uh, so, for example, a CMI sound card driver used to call PCI set power state before PCI save state, which means that it was trying to save the control registers of the driver of the device after uh, the power was already, uh, it wasn't all, but it was in low power mode, so the registers weren't available anymore, which means that when it tries to uh, resume the device afterwards, it will basically be in a random rubber state. And finally, drivers share data with operating systems through various descriptors. And if the driver is unable to format the descriptors appropriately, uh, it can easily crash the system. So for example, every PCI driver has to export a table of PCI uh, uh, device descriptors. 
which has to be null terminated, which wasn't the case for the I-810 driver. Um, so all of these software protocol violations accounted for 20% of bugs in our study. The third category of bugs are not related to a particular part of the device functionality, but rather to the, um, to the model of computation uh, for device drivers. Uh, the Linux kernel is multi-threaded and drivers are part of the kernel, which means that the driver has to be prepared to be invoked from uh, several concurrent threads. In particular, in most drivers, any of these five events can happen uh, in parallel. It can get an IO request from the kernel to send or receive data. It can get an RQ, a power management request, a configuration request, or a hot unplug notification. And multi-threading is generally difficult and programmers scrub all the time. In drivers, it's harder, even harder, because a driver can be invoked in an inter inter interrupt context where it's not allowed to block, which means that if you want to do something that will take time or requires taking a look in interrupt context, you have to schedule it to happen in a separate thread in the a, in, in a, in a bottom half, which adds synchronization complexity. So 19% of driver bugs, of the bugs that we looked at, are uh, race conditions and deadlocks. Uh, if you look at these bugs more closely, it's curious that they tend to happen in corner cases. They almost never happen in the data pass when the driver is just sending or receiving data, either because it's well, uh, well debugged or because um, there are no really complex synchronization patterns there. Usually these bugs happen when something unusual occurs. For example, when the driver is busy sending data and suddenly uh, Linux tries to reconfigure it somehow, or when the device is unplugged while you're working with it. So in the second, second biggest group of bugs. And the third biggest group of concurrency errors are um, when you're invoked in interrupt context, but you don't realize that you're in interrupt context and or just accidentally try to take a look and you deadlock the kernel. Um, so finally, the remaining 23% of bugs are what we call generic errors. So basically, these are things that are not um, specific to drivers. It's uh, things like uh, use after free, um, forgetting to release a log after taking a log, um, but also just, just usual errors in the, in the logic of the driver. So, to be honest, so far we haven't discovered anything new, because if you talk to anyone who writes drivers, he will tell you, yeah, this, this is the kind of things that we have to deal with, these are the kind of problems that we have to solve. Uh, still, it's nice to have this big picture because now we can look at it and decide uh, what can be potentially improved. So, for example, there is not much that we can do with, with uh, device protocol violations because until device vendors start providing decent documentation, it's going to be hard to get drivers right. So, as, as kernel developer, there is not much that we can improve without their assistance. Uh, likewise, generic errors probably can be somewhat reduced using static analysis tools, but otherwise these are just usual software bugs and getting rid of them is just as difficult as getting rid of bugs and software in general. So we cannot expect any dramatic improvements there. However, the two other groups of bugs, the software protocol relations and concurrency errors, are directly related to how, uh, to how the driver interacts with the Linux kernel and potentially they can be reduced by making Linux kernel more driver friendly. Um, so that's what we tried to do. We uh, proposed some changes that could be made to Linux kernel to reduce this kind of bugs. Um, whether they will be eventually adopted or not, or in what form they will be adopted is up to the community. We are just trying to point to some possibilities of what could be improved. So. I look at uh, how it proposed to reduce concurrency errors first. So as I said, concurrency errors are due to multi-threading. And so we might ask why drivers need to be multi-threaded in the first place. Um, well, obviously it is because the driver has to be able to do several things at the same time, so it needs concurrency. So it needs to handle several data requests at the same time, and it needs to be able to handle, for example, power management requests while dealing with data. Uh, so that's why it's multi-threaded. However, multi-threading is not the only way to implement concurrency. There are other concurrency models which are much friendlier than threads. Uh, for example, 
one that we are studying is the event-driven model. So in the event-driven model, uh, the program executes in a sequence of short atomic reactions. So all requests are serialized by the environment. There is still concurrency in this model in the sense that you can have, uh, you can interleave requests that relate to different activities. So you can have your power management request interleaved with, uh, with data requests. Uh, how, since each particular event executes atomically, you don't need logs, uh, bottom house, whatever synchronization primitives you normally use. Um, okay, so essentially with events we replace uh, instruction level interleaving, which is what multi-threading does. It interleaves multiple activities at the instruction level, which is very hard to handle, with event level interleaving which is much easier to handle, which is a good thing about this model. The main limitation of events is that you're not allowed to block, because if you could block in an event handler, then you would prevent all other events from being delivered, uh, which would kill the performance at the very least. Um, which means that operations that would otherwise take some time or would require blocking need to be split into chains of requests and completions. Um, so this is how it's done. So imagine that we have uh, a normal blocking request, so the kernel calls the driver and it blocks waiting for its reply. The driver then sends request to the device and then it just blocks waiting for a completion notification from the device. And then the device is done doing whatever it's doing, it sends an RQ to the driver and finally the driver returns control to the kernel. Uh, implementing this same behavior in a non-blocking way is shown on the right, right hand side. So again, the kernel sends request to the driver, the driver sends request to the hardware, and then returns control immediately to the, to the operating system. And then when an RQ arrives, it invokes the driver through a new entry point, and the driver generates completion notification to the kernel. Uh, so this kind of uh, completion chaining programming is actually very well familiar to driver developers because all the, um, all the Actual data handling is implemented in this way already in drivers, which is a good thing. However, there are still situations where blocking is very useful and we really don't want to do without it. So to give an example, imagine that we have a hypothetical driver uh, and its probe function configures the device by writing some configuration registers and then waits for 20 milliseconds for the device to finish initializing and then it checks the status of the device by reading some status registers. So the sleep function here will just block for 20 milliseconds and it's a nice and natural way to express the control flow of the driver. If you want to implement it in a non-blocking way, we have to replace this blocking and sleep function with an event-based one. And what that will do, it will schedule a 12, 12, 20 milliseconds delay and then it will return control immediately to the driver. And as an argument, it will take um, a pointer to a continuation function which will be invoked when the timeout expires. And then inside the continuation function, it picks up, it picks up where it stopped before, uh, before the timeout. Uh, which looks reasonably innocuous in this simple case, but if you have to, um, to convert more complex control logic into this completion style, uh, uh, request completion style, chaining, chaining style, um, it becomes royal pain, you really don't want to do this. Uh, and the problem here is that essentially once you rip your function into <coughs> separate bits, you lose control for a lot of things that language gives you for free, such as tracking the control flow, local variables, stack um, loops. Um, and you start doing them manually by basically doing hex. So fortunately there is a way to combine all this nice uh, language mechanism with event-based programming. And we implemented one of these ways, which is basically to use <coughs> a simple, a set of simple macros for C and a simple preprocessor for C to handle these macros. Question? Um, so this is how the same bit of code looks uh, written for our preprocessor. So instead of calling the blocking and sleep function, we use a call macro, which behaves exactly as you would uh, expect a normal function call to behave. What it actually does inside, it saves the current execution context of the function with all its, all its local variable and uh, IP value in a continuation structure. 
uh, and then it passes a pointer to the continuation structure to the to the M sleep function which it calls. And so when the timeout expires, this continuation will restore the state of the function to where it, where it, uh, to where it was interrupted. Uh, so as you see, it's a little bit more code than in the original implementation, uh, but it's constant overhead as opposed to the exponential overhead which you get when you start ripping uh, functions into request completion chains. So it's actually quite practical. Um, so this is how an event-driven driver looks from inside. The next question is, what do we need to do to the Linux kernel to support such drivers? Uh, there are a few things that need to be done, but the main one, we need to somehow serialize everything that goes into the driver. And, and a new way of doing that would be just to put a mutex. And uh, then whoever got the mutex first calls the driver, everyone else is waiting for him, which is totally catastrophic for performance, especially on, on a multiprocessor machine. So we need to do something smarter. So what we actually do is um, we use a request queue. So whoever wants to call the driver puts the request in a queue and then just keeps doing whatever it was doing. Um, so yes, yeah, the request queue is still a point of uh, serialization, but because the critical section that you need to use to put something in a queue is really small, it's not really an issue. Um, so we've actually implemented this. It's a very experimental implementation. We're near getting into mainline or uh, getting in the kernel. Uh, we called our system Dingo. And one of the drivers that we built for Dingo is a driver for this USB to Ethernet adapter device. Uh, so the main purpose was to see whether how much performance it will cost us to replace um, to replace multi-threaded drivers with event-driven drivers. Um, because our implementation is basically a wrapper around each driver that uh, translates multi-threaded protocol of Linux into an event driven protocol. And it turns out that the overhead is very minimal. So yeah, I'm not sure if this is a really good example because network drivers are both like these. <laughs> they, they have a single transmit queue anyway. So essentially, even in the old model, you would go through a single event queue. Now, I think we're, 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 it would really be interesting to see what the overhead is, is if we look at a multi-queue driver where we rely on all the CPUs doing work at the same time. Yes. And a good example of multi-queue driver would be InfiniBand, I guess. Because, so, so there, are, there are types of hardware which have a lot of concurrency inside. So hardware is actually built to serve multiple independent clients. Uh, so in, InfiniBand is one of those kind of drivers. And we actually, we looked at those drivers as well. And we did a driver for InfiniBand. InfiniBand is faster than 10 gigabit, actually, I think. Okay. Anyway, we do have a solution for that. So the idea is, um, if you go back to this picture, um, as I said, the data pass is not very complicated from the synchronization point of view. Most bugs are not in the data pass. So what we do is we allow concurrency selectively only the data pass. So all the configuration, hot plugging, power management control functions are serialized with respect to each other and with respect to data. However, for those really high performance drivers where you really, really want um, multi-threading, uh, you can run uh, data functions in parallel with each other. And uh, again, we measured performance. It was uh, essentially indistinguishable from Linux. So, yeah. Okay, so this is how we handle concurrency bugs. Uh, another group of bugs that we are trying to handle our uh, software protocol violations. So basically situations where the driver doesn't behave as Linux wants it to. Um, yep. So our idea there is that if you look at these protocols, they're not really particularly complicated. There's nothing intrinsically complex about them. Problem is they're not really documented. So if you look at Linux headers or whatever documentation is there, it will list, basically give you a list of functions that you have to implement, which you have to use. It will not tell you in what order they can be invoked and in what states and uh, relations between them. And doesn't even document uh, the uh, arguments, restrictions very well. So we believe that if you just add 
uh, easy to use, nice documentation. It will already be useful for driver developers. It will help them avoid many bugs. And uh, the best language we, we could come up with is state machines because, first of all, we found them very adequate for documenting driver interfaces because, in a way, drivers are state machines. They are well understood by all engineers, so programmers usually know state machines. Uh, so we started with simple state machines, in the end we ended up with a somewhat more complex language, but it's still simple and visual and easy to understand. So for example, this is a fragment of a state machine for a network driver. So after it was initialized, it's in the disabled state, then you can open it, and after open is complete, you can send and receive data, and then you can stop it. Plus, in any state, you can suspend the driver. And, um, so, well, at least that's, this is what Linux expects uh, a driver to be able to do. So, just uh, seeing this behavior represented visually like this is probably useful. For example, you know that, well, even while I'm being disabled, I still, like in this transitional state, I should still be prepared to handle the suspend event uh, if I don't want to crash in this case. Uh, another benefit of drawing the state machines, I believe that they also help the, the Linux kernel developers to define better protocols. For example, once again, looking at this state machine, is it really essential for the driver to be able to be suspended in the disabled state? Because it's obviously, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a potential place where errors will be introduced. Can we simplify this protocol by moving some of its complexity from the driver to the kernel? Um, so this is one way to simplify it. So now we only allow suspend when the driver is in the disabled and in the enabled state, but not in between. So there are a couple of less, fewer kernel cases to handle for the driver developer. Um, so obviously it will not eliminate uh, all protocol relations altogether, but hopefully it will make them much less frequent. Um, so, as I said, we don't really have productive production quality implementation, but if you want to look at an um, example of an event-driven driver based on state machines, you can look at the source file available from this link. Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, well, ideally all of them, but the best candidates are those drivers which, um, which are control-dominated rather than data-dominated. Well, I think it basically applies to most drivers. So Ethernet was a good example, but uh, all the USB drivers. So we actually done a lot of work on USB drivers, and USB state machines are particularly complex, so that's where we saw a lot of benefit of using state machines and of using event-driven models. So, for example, I don't have, unfortunately, a state machine for a USB hub driver, but that's a really beautiful state machine. And looking at it, I, mean, I don't know how you can possibly implement this correctly without looking at the state machine. Um, Firewire probably a good candidate as well. Um, so there are basically two parts to it, right? So there is uh, event-driven stuff and uh, the state machine stuff. Uh, I think that event-driven stuff is useful. It's universally useful for all, for all drivers because all drivers have concurrency. But the problem is it only becomes useful uh, once you've implemented the framework once. One, once you've implemented a, a, a wrapper for a family of drivers. Otherwise, you basically have to do the same thing you would do otherwise. But However, the state machines, if you just use them informally, if you just think about how a driver should behave and document it in a state machine, I think you will find that it will help a lot. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you generate the actual source code from that state machine model? 
Uh, that's a good question, not at the moment. All we do at the moment is given a state machine, we can generate an observer which sits between the driver and the Linux kernel and checks, uh, and checks that the driver behaves correctly at runtime. Uh, so it's basically a debugging tool. What we are working on at the moment is actually complete automatic driver synthesis from specification. So the idea there is that all that you need to know to write a correct driver, all this knowledge already exists uh, during the design of the device. So all you need to do is, all that the driver developer is doing is trying to rediscover this knowledge once again from crappy documentation. So if instead you formally describe your device interface, then there is nothing preventing you from doing this job automatically. Of course, this again requires a lot of cooperation from device vendors. So what we're doing currently is automatic synthesis of drivers from device specification, and we've actually done it already for this, uh, for this device. So it's kind of starting to show some promise. Okay, thank you very much.